everyone to another edition of Corey Means Business uh, podcast and YouTube show. Where's the applause, man? And producer is sleeping on the job. <laughs> I, I do it when you uh, introduce the guests. Oh, is that where it is? Okay. All right. All right. Now I see how it is. So I don't get my applause. I get no, the only no, the guests no. get the applause. <laughs> I get I get the intro. All right, so I get the intro, but then the guests get the applause. All right, I got it, I got it. All right. Well, welcome to another edition, even though I'm not going to get my applause, of Corey Means Business Podcast and YouTube show. Today we got a good one. Uh, this is a brand new uh, business. Just got launched. It is in its second month, and there's already some pretty excited things happening. And uh, another one that makes this unique as well is that I'm actually personally involved with it, uh, as well as uh, a couple of really great guys. So with us today is Don Ehrlich. <laughs> See, there's the applause. There's the applause. There it is. Got one. And BJD, a.k.a. Buster J. Davis. That's a fact. Hey, there's the applause. There's the applause. All right, all right, all right, all right. Thank, thank you kindly. Thank you kindly. Hey, uh, before we get started, if uh, you guys are new to the show, please subscribe, like, share where you can. If uh, you're someone that keeps coming back for some more punishment, we really appreciate that. Again, please like, subscribe, and share wherever you can. The more we can get these messages out to people, uh, the more we can empower businesses, the better off we're all going to be. So it is rather important, and I hope we bring some entertainment value to you guys as well well so it's not too boring kind of a business in a fun way uh so little little entertainment little business right little little learning so uh this is a new business uh we just started it i started it with a good buddy of mine uh donnie aka donald ehrlich uh we have a master technician uh on the team that is just spectacular when it comes to the actual skill set of the uh of the of the of the product uh which it's PPF, a.k.a. Paint Protection Film. Am I saying that right, Buster? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, it's new to me. I didn't even really know about it six months ago. I got introduced to me. I mean, I knew the clear broad and the clear protection stuff, but it really wasn't where it's at today. So it's actually a really, really, what's exciting about it, it's a really evolving industry. Some of the products that are coming out are just absolutely amazing. It's not, it's not, it's what's the old saying? It's not your parents clear bra right <laughs> so this is not your parents clear bra all right don't confuse it with that uh this is serious serious paint protection uh self-healing all kinds of other properties so um i'm gonna let uh buster tell us a little bit more about it so tell us tell the audience what is different about today's products paint protection products versus let's say 10 years ago or 15 years ago Ooh. 10 years ago uh the paint protection film that was out, um, it did not have the properties to um, non-yellow, to not non-yellow. So the material that you see on older vehicles, a lot of motor homes and stuff like that on the front ends, um, they they start yellowing after time, you know, and it, it's, it just looks real bad. Uh, the material actually, the adhesive is is really, really strong, which, which is good, uh, you know, theoretically speaking, but in this uh, situation with vehicles and it, it can get real messy because when you actually want to remove it after the yellowing starts to happen with the old material, right. it actually will start pulling the paint right oh, off, wow. right, right off of the coach or car or whatever it is. Right. Um, especially, you know, it, it gets cooked on there and the old material is it gets pretty bad. It comes off in tiny little pieces. It gets brittle over time. It's kind of like that old uh, tint that was purple, right? You mm -hmm. see people right. driving around yeah. town that had purple, <laughs> purple windows. You're know, like, yeah. damn, time to change that tint. Yeah. Uh, so kind of like that, right? And I'm sure yeah. that, you know, the tint industry has come a long way, too. I haven't seen purple tint in a while. So no. I, think, I guess they solved that problem also. So yeah. superior product, superior adhesive. Yep. Um, what, what, what else is special about it? What other properties does it have that, that makes it, uh, you know, makes the new stuff like, where the, this market's really going to start taking off. Yeah, the product itself. So uh, one of the biggest things that that, um, that they changed with the product is it's a self-healing product. So with um, even room temperature, uh, in a room temperature setting, the material will actually heal itself from swirl marks. So you can, 
you know, because uh, when you're just washing your car every day and you wipe it down, you can have the nicest, softest uh, rags, but you're still going to leave micro scratches, which are swirl marks um, in the paint. Um, but if you have the paint protection film, it can cause minor swirl marks and the, the material will self heal. Um, so all of that will go away uh, in a matter of, you know, 30 minutes and uh, oh. you won't have to worry about any of that. Um, like I said earlier, it's non-yellowing. Uh, it's UV protectant. Um, so you don't have to worry about your paint fading. Um, is there is there a shorter version of this story? Uh, I'm sorry. Story? I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> this is his first time doing something like this. So, you know, he's not a pro like oh. me. You know how comfortable I am with the camera. I never get awkward of any kind. So, anyway. I go on my rants, you know? Yeah, like yeah, rants. yeah. Well, you know, because he's... He loves it. I mean, obviously, he's got uh, the skill. He's been doing it for a long time. How long have you been doing it for? I've been doing it for going on five years. Okay, so going five. So we do it for a while. Yeah, and he's not an old man either. So five no. years for him is a long time. See, for me, that's like a <laughs> few few weeks ago. But an old man, an old man years, that's like actually not very much time at all. But in young man years that he is, that's actually like what quarter of a lifetime, something. Yeah, like that. pretty much. Yeah, pretty <laughs> he's not know. that young. Yeah. But uh, okay, so. One other thing I, I know about it too, uh, which amazed me, was because I was a customer before I, you know, before we did this, uh, was just like even on a brand new vehicle, you know, and all my vehicles are, are brand new. Like just the difference in the depth it brings to the paint, and you guys can go check out. You know, we'll have links obviously to to uh, uh, the Instagram and the uh, the Facebook CCD Auto Shield. Uh, you can go look at the before and afters on brand new vehicles. We're not talking like these are 10 year old vehicles. These are brand new vehicles that after just a few washes, you get like these swirl marks. And when you do the, the, the paint protection on there, it literally takes care of the swirl marks, uh, you know, and which is absolutely amazing. Cause again, my vehicles are brand new and they were starting to look a little hazy and you don't really notice it, but then you put the PPF on a section of it or something like that. And you're just like, holy crap, it's like a new paint job now. Um, yeah. It's really dramatic. It, it's, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, it is really dramatic. You can check out the before and after pictures, again, on brand new vehicles, um, especially darker vehicles, right? Yeah, um, and even um, just like with your, uh, your BMW, I mean, even with the satin, um, putting the satin PPF on a satin vehicle, I mean, it still adds that depth and it actually brought out a lot of that metallic that is in your paint. Because that's true. You, you have that's the true. metallic. And it, it definitely, it makes the, the sparkle sparkle even more. Yeah. So I noticed that with my, with my sand rail too, it just gave it that extra, extra depth oh, big uh, time. with that. So yeah, it, it's amazing material. Uh, he's amazing installer. Uh, you know, he, he can, you know, what, what what's your razor your razor cuts or what oh, you get a little my, saying don't you my little my little hand jobs you know <laughs> <laughs> it's a family show man it's a family show um yeah his his his, his uh i thought you had a saying i swear to god you had a saying no um, your razor cuts were like yeah my just, samurai sharp or something no, or i'm not that cool <laughs> Sushi, sushi, sushi's Never got right. nothing on you or something like that. <laughs> I don't play no games. All right. Well, yeah, I know it's amazing stuff and uh, he's really, really good at it. So, uh, you know, it, it, sky's the limit for him. Uh, now, uh, my good friend Donnie here, uh, we do business on a number of levels. He's actually a farmer's agent. Um, we were friends before he was my insurance agent, then became my insurance agent. And then we started doing other business together. And now we're doing this project together, which is pretty exciting. Uh, so tell us a bit more about you, Donnie, like just what your background is and like what the hell made you decide to get into something like this? Yeah. So I've been doing insurance now for coming up on 22 years here now. It's been uh, quite some time uh, with farmer's insurance, took over a family run business. Uh, my grandfather started it. Then my, uh, my dad had it after that. And, oh, nice. And when my dad had to step out uh, due to some health-related issues, I, I bought into the business and been running it ever since. So I took that over when I was 25, 41 now. So been running it for quite some time. Yeah. And uh, just looking for something additional to do. I mean, I'm in the insurance business as it is. Um, people have a lot of damage happen to their vehicles, you know, from time to time. And, you know, this is just another added layer of protection, just like insurance is, in my opinion. And uh, being able to help people make their vehicles, you know, look good as long as possible, this product's going to do it. Because uh, one thing to add to what Buster was saying is 
this product has a 10 year warranty on it as well. Right. Um, you know, so wanting to get into a little bit of a side gig, uh, you know, I'm a car enthusiast on top of that, you know, I own a couple different vehicles in the sand row myself and, you know, just wanted to keep my own stuff looking as good as long as possible. And, right. um, you get to meet great people throughout this style of business as well. Um, and do what you love at the end of the day. Right. So, right. Yeah. yeah. And, and just in our time of knowing each other, I mean, I know you're an entrepreneur at heart. You're always looking for a business angle or a business idea. And, you know, uh, we got little games we play when we hang out, you know, we start like coming up with like different ways that you can make money and different businesses that you could do and services you could offer. And, uh, you know, shock ourselves sometimes because we get brainstorming, right? So right. if we have a few drinks on us, you really get <laughs> brainstorming and you're like, holy shit, man, that could be like a really good idea. I know one of the things that uh, um, I think clicked for me to actually start doing this and just a little background on why I'm involved with it. And again, hopefully, I, you know, according means business, I better be an entrepreneur at heart, right? But uh, I hired Buster, uh, what, six, seven months ago now? And you, you came out, he wanted to move out from California, you're from San Diego. Yes, uh, he lived in San Diego his whole life. And he wanted to move out here uh, to Arizona just to get the hell out of the craziness that's California, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and he, he actually came out just to, like, you know, take care of all my stuff. I got so much crap and so much toys, uh, sand rails and razors and a big shop and just, you know, RVs and everything. And he came out just to do that. But then I found out that he really had this skill um, I said, well, crap, let's, you know, let's do something with it besides just, you know, have you work on my crap. Let's, uh, let's have, let's, let's have, let's have you cover my crap too. Right. Yeah. So besides just working on my crap, he started covering my crap. And I started looking about how amazing my crap was looking. I was like, Buster, my crap is looking really amazing. It's amazing. Looking and you got I say crap, I mean like, you know, all my toys. So uh, I will feature those two. Again, if you go to CCD, you'll see uh, all that stuff. And we haven't even started on the RV yet, uh, which is, I, I'm really jonesing to do. Uh, actually, project. I'm getting a new, I'm getting a bigger garage uh, just so I can actually get my RV done. <laughs> <laughs> 10,000 square foot facility just so I can get the RV going. Uh, but there's more opportunity than that. Okay, so that, so that the origin of it was, uh, again, he comes out to work on my stuff. He's a mechanic as well. And that's kind of your background was really mechanical stuff. It wasn't even actually doing the uh, the film, right? You, you were first a mechanic. I mean, you yeah. were a wrencher, yeah. you liked working on cars and all that stuff. That's really kind of where you got your start, right? Yeah. So how did you go from uh, being a mechanic and doing just mechanic stuff to doing the film stuff? Well, um, I mean, as some people might know from working in the uh, automotive industry on the mechanic end, I mean, it can get a little rough sometimes and things can get weird. And I looked for different avenues of making money and uh, different opportunities and I came across a gentleman that was looking for um, for help with his business, and he he was installing paint protection film. And it's it's crazy because I actually got hired to help him with paint protection film, and then he saw the opportunity from my mechanic side, and I started doing mechanic um, work for him, and then I started installing paint protection film, and I really just grew to love it. I really enjoy it. It's an instant gratification, nice. and it, it it really is something I enjoy doing. Well, it's, you know, and it's, you guys know this on every show. Whenever I have a creative on the show, you know, you guys, I always tell everybody my, you know, my creative ability is like nothing. My, my stick figures look like crap. I can't cut, I, I can't wrap Christmas presents. I mean, you, you should see my Christmas presents. Christmas coming up, it's on my mind. <laughs> But you see my Christmas present wrapping, and it is bad. I just say, just don't turn it over. You know, as long as you look at just one side, don't look at the mess that's at the bottom. Because <laughs> I can't cut wrapping paper to save my life. Like, that's how bad I am at stuff like that. So it's always amazing when I have a creative on or, you know, work, when, I, when, I, when I get to see somebody that's really creative like that, it actually has that artistic ability because it's an ability I don't have. Um, so it always kind of uh, amazes me, and he, and he definitely has it. But it's that, I would assume it's that, you know, you get to just stand back like an hour later, two hours later, and you get to say, wow, what a dramatic difference, right? I mean, you get to Big see time. the difference. We just, before uh, we started filming the show, we had a uh, uh, one of my guys, is, uh, it was getting his truck done, um, his Ram, and it's a new truck. Right? It's like eight months old, nine months old, so it's almost a brand new truck. And just the difference in the paint from, you know, what you would, what you had paint protected and the, his paint, which is like 10 months old and, He's been meticulously taking care of it. Yeah. It's a dramatic difference. I mean, it's like night and day. So 
I'd imagine the gratification of seeing something like that. And I know you had a, uh, uh, a Subaru WRX in here yesterday. Yeah. Uh, Katana uh, is the name of the, the, the WRX. And for, you know, for what it is, I mean, everybody loves that car, man. Oh, it's yeah. just like, it's, it's a good like, looking car. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's like, you know, if, if you're coming from the fast and the furious generation, right. Right. Uh, you know, you're like, that's like a fast and the furious car. Like you're always a, there's always an affinity. I, I see like a little civic or whatever, you know, if it's all fast and furious, up you know i'm like oh man that's badass right <laughs> yeah yeah that that so, subaru was beautiful it was a beautiful car and it's crazy because the owner of that car takes care of that car like it's his child and um it's still you know the before and after on on the on the car was absolutely phenomenal added a bunch of depth yet again took away a lot of the or took away all of the swirl marks that were in the paint and everything and it came out beautiful Right, the right. difference was so dramatic. He decided that he's going to do the entire car. Yep. He came in for just the front end, and now he's going to do the rest of the car. He's coming back. Oh, wow. Is that yeah, what he, he said? He said he's going to do oh. the whole car. Amazing. Because of how, how much the difference is. He, well, he wants the whole car to look that good. Yeah. Well, I know for you and me, especially on our cars, too, because he's right. had several cars done. Of course, the first thing we did when we started this business was get all of our own stuff done. Right. Uh, and I know for you, same thing for me, it's like you can see such a dramatic difference on the parts that are done versus the parts that aren't. And it's like, ah, oh, I got to do, now I got to do the roof. rest of it. Oh, and I got to do the truck. Now I got to <laughs> yeah. do the rest of it. Like you end up having to do the whole rest of it. Um, especially because you got your, you got all your sand rail done too. Correct. Yeah. We did the whole, whole sand rail. Now yeah. that was, that was actually uh, done in the satin, wasn't it? Correct. Yeah. It was all done. How'd that turn out? How'd that turn out? Beautiful. Um, I mean, Again, just no imperfections. It's 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 like it's a perfect paint job right out of paint shop, right? And it's going to look like that for probably the next ten years now, yeah. Because it's going to self heal. Even the satin product self heals, right? So again, no nicks, no swirl marks, no lights. Yeah, that's the amazing part about this product. I mean, the most amazing thing to me is that right no that it, it self heals. Yeah. Like if you do get a scratch, if you do a little scratch, you do get a rock chip or something like that, it's going to like heal itself. Let or it the if the sun doesn't do it, you can take a little heat gun and you can just run it over and it just like disappears. I've actually seen uh, uh, videos. Maybe we we'll put a few links to that where they were literally taking it because they have it on. You know, I think. Every supercar nowadays is getting it. I mean, it doesn't yeah, right. leave the dealership without being covered from top to bottom. And they literally are taking sandpaper and just scraping it all over the top of this, you know, brand new Bugatti. And you're like, oh, my God. But then they just take a heat gun and just, boom, it's like it's gone. gone Do that with your paint. See, that, see how that right. works, right? <laughs> um, yeah, just absolutely amazing stuff. And I can't believe, I mean, you know, especially because we're sand rail guys, you know, we, we do the off-road stuff. I mean, anybody that's got a nice sand rail, if you guys aren't getting it done, I mean, you got to be crazy. I mean, right, it, yeah. it, even if you have a wrap, right? You can because you can put oh, it yeah. over the top of a wrap. So yeah. I know some of the guys with sand rails actually have wraps on their cars. Yeah, yeah, we can go right over uh, vinyl, and yet again, it takes all those. And vinyl is a very uh, sensitive material compared to uh, the paint protection film. So it's not self healing then. No, it is not self healing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's more self destructive, right? Right. It, it gets scratches and and uh, and chips very very easily. So w luckily, we can go over the vinyl with the paint protection film. Yeah, yeah. So then you end up protecting the vinyl. Yep. So if you you know your if your sand rail didn't really have that great of a paint job, and so you got some vinyl on it, uh, now you want to protect the vinyl because you want to do that again. The PPF will then do that as for you as well. Plus, it'll give it more depth. I bet you too. Oh yeah, yeah. I've definitely I've had my fair share of um, of wrapping PPF over vinyl, and it 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 definitely adds way more of a gloss factor. Right. So it's it's more reflective, more shiny. So it probably ends up looking like it's a paint job. Yeah, it does for a fraction of the price. Yep. Overall, yeah. Because if you look at a paint, I mean, if you look at a really nice paint job on a sand rail. I know like mine, you know, that's like a $25,000 paint job. Yeah. You know, you could do a wrap that looks just like it, but then everyone's know, know it's a wrap because it won't mm -hmm. have that pop to it. Yeah. But you put the PPF over it and you take a $2,500 wrap and you put, you know, the PPF over it. And you know, now you got just as good as a $25,000 paint job yep. for a, a quarter of the price. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, amazing for for the sand industry. And we're going to go to the dunes next weekend, actually, and and uh, we're going to be out there representing uh, uh, Clear Choice Designs. And uh, I can't wait to see the looks on the faces of every, of, of all the sand rail guys when they start coming around saying like, "What's this? What's that?" Because I guarantee you, I've been I've been in the sand game for a long time. Uh, I've had a lot of sand rails, and I've never I never even thought. I mean, again, which is weird. From a consumer perspective, from a customer perspective, I never made the connection between, yeah, I knew that there was like this, you know, the, the, this paint protection stuff out there, 
but never even crossed my mind that he could put on a sand rail because I because the self healing issue, yep. right? It, to me, I was just thought like, well, I'll just get destroyed like right away and look like crap. So why would you bother? Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, because I had no idea that, that stuff was self healing. Uh, you know, absolutely amazing products. We can't wait to take it out to 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 uh, to the dunes, to Glamis, and and to uh, Gordon's Well next weekend. All right, so that's the stuff. That's what we're doing. Um, now let's talk a little bit more about the meat and potatoes, uh, which I know a lot of you want to find out more about because we're starting the business from scratch and we're doing it, you know, even though we have really, you know, an unlimited budget, we could do whatever, but we're, we're, I'm taking it as a personal challenge, honestly, on myself to do it with as little money as possible, because this is a case study for Corey means business as well. That was another reason why I got involved in the project was because I wanted to make it just a, a case study. I don't deal with startups usually because they're just not in a position to be able to use the stuff that I do. Uh, don't have the resources usually um, to be able to, to do it and afford it. So I don't get a lot of chance to do startups. Uh, so when this came to, uh, around to actually be part of the startup and then to actually use it as a case study for Corey Means Business, I was like, I cannot not do it. So now the challenge is... Because I don't want to do it and then be like, yeah, you know, I threw $300,000 at it and blah, 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 right? Because we that's cheating, right? You, you can't, I mean, it's hard to fail if you can just like take, you know, half a million dollars and go start your business. That's not even like fair, okay? So when I look at businesses that get, you know, that are startups and businesses that start, it's not the same, right? So when you're a small business owner or when you're starting a small business, you don't have many resources. You don't have much to work with. I mean, I've, I've had people on the show from what season one, uh, um, Emilio that started literally with like $500 and that was like their budget. Right. And they started a business with $500. Wow. So, um, and I started many businesses with not much money. I mean, a lot more than $500, but you know, not, not millions. Uh, so the challenge for me really is to launch the company first class though, um, and do it for as cheap as possible. So it's not cheating. Okay. Just skill set, know how, uh, and then the management ability of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, Donald and, and, and his wife, uh, Janelle, who were partners in the business and they, uh, um, their skill set when it comes to actually the accounting and the back and the, the back office stuff, uh, um, dealing with the control and stuff like that. So Donnie, talk to us you're being a little quiet over here you got to start speaking up uh what what role are you playing in the business exactly and what what would you tell or give advice to people that are starting businesses as far as like what what should you be paying attention to uh you know what matters most like when you were setting this business up what mattered the most right um and in looking at beginning the business right from ground zero um the biggest importance was, you know, just paying attention to, to what our costs were going to be, knowing what those were going to be before we even started the whole process. Right. Um, so reaching out to the company for uh, the product. Uh, obviously, I did a lot of research throughout all the different companies uh, that are available for uh, paint protection film. Um, the company that we specifically chose, uh, again, uh, we were able to get a good price point with them. Uh, just doing a lot of that background research to, to know that we can keep our costs to a minimum um, cause if we can do that, uh, then obviously it's, we, we're going to have bigger profits, uh, right. when it comes to the price point when we sell the product. Um, so paying attention to that, uh, doing a lot of that background research obviously was a huge deal. Um, I mean, other than that, uh, my part in it in, in paying attention to those costs is, uh, reaching out to like corporate accounts. Um, you know, going, you know, I'd have to say to new business owners, you know, don't be fearful for, uh, what you might be able to obtain. Um, I mean, we literally went straight to a uh, Ford dealership right here in Tucson and uh, pitched it to them and uh, they needed it, found out they needed it. They, uh, they weren't happy with the, the uh, company they were using. Turnaround times were uh, awfully slow. Right. And uh, now we've got seven dealerships uh, that are going to be selling this product for us uh, right to brand new customers on brand new cars, protect them before they even leave the lot. Right. Um, so, I mean, that would be good advice uh, that, that I would say to any new person is definitely do a lot of research on what your expenses are going to be. Know how deep you're going to get into it before you pull the trigger. And then don't be fearful for, uh, you know, looking where you can get the business from. 
Right. I mean, uh, we're a brand new business and we've got a dealership that's going to support us now. Right. So uh, obviously we met with them. They were impressed, obviously, with Buster's technique, the product we have and things of that nature. So uh, well, it just worked it, out. It, yeah, and I agree with you 100%. You know, and one of the things, obviously, we you know we do have some advantages. It's not like, again, I'm we're trying to do the startup again as a challenge as far as limited resources, but we have a lot of business experience. Obviously, Don has been right. in business for, again for you know almost twenty years, uh, and Buster from a, you know the aspect of actually being able to to deploy the skill set that's that's being involved, which is the actual application of the product. Um, you guys are not startups, right? Uh, and obviously my marketing ability and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, visual stuff that I'm doing for the website and for the social media and all that stuff is, is that's my area of expertise. And month one, uh, the first month we, uh, in business, first month actively in business, we secured Harley Davidson contract with the Harley Davidson both, dealership, yeah, both dealerships for Harley and Davidson. a deal uh, and a contract with a Ford, uh, dealership. So, Month one in business, limited budget. Again, like Donnie said, you know, don't don't let that hold you back from going and going to your to to the customers you want to do business with, because it doesn't matter, right? So some people would think like, oh well, until you're in business for ten years, you can't get a major Ford dealership or a Harley Davidson, you know, major dealership. Uh, they're public traded companies. Uh, well, the, the Harley Davidson uh, dealership is is a public traded company. Um, and the Ford dealership uh, is is huge, uh, and again they're they're multi state, and I mean got just you know a couple of hundred million dollar uh, businesses. So we've got public traded companies coming on board as customers month one out of the gate with limited resources. Now, again, because of the business acumen that we have, which is in the marketing, sales, and uh, back office structure, uh, and again Donnie's area of expertise and and uh, and his wife's area of expertise is that cost control inventory uh because your wife ran a another business right she Correct, ran a yeah. uh, a tanning salon yeah she ran a tanning salon we started from the ground as well okay never been in that business before either right and uh that one was a little interesting we literally sat there for almost a year and had almost nobody coming through the door until we figured out how to do a little bit of marketing such as what you talk about right um, obviously not the style of how you handle it. And many years ago at the same time, it was just literally on the internet and a website. Oh, it changes. Yeah. Um, but again, well, this uh, is pre all the tools. Yeah, we have exactly. Today. Yeah. And, uh, the, the biggest thing that got us through that was making sure that we could get the best, uh, price on our materials. Right. Um, because we, we struggled in the beginning, um, after owning it for eight years, she ended up becoming the largest tanning salon in, in the city of Tucson. She was endorsed by uh, the local university and, and so forth. I mean, it, wow. it worked out really well, but a lot, of, a lot of hard work grinding. You know, that was a seven-day-a-week job. Right. Uh, you know, I think, I uh, can't remember the total hours per week, but there were days it was open, you know, 14 hours a day. Wow. So um, it, was, it was a grind, but it worked out really well. Again, from from the journey that you guys will have in business, right, and you know, in your careers and in business, you can see the dynamic there. So you can take a tanning salon, and if you do certain things properly, you can make it extremely successful because uh, you apply the same principles that you learned in, in the insurance business, right? Uh, and then you can take those same principles and apply them to an insurance company, and then make that insurance company or insurance agency super successful, or you can apply it to a, uh, you know, uh, a new business like uh, uh, CCD and take those same business concepts and same business knowledge and instantly make it successful. Right. Uh, and that's really what the point is. The point is, is that, you know, between Donnie and I, you know, I'm in financial services, he's in financial services, but he's done tanning, you know, I've, I, I uh, now am doing the, uh, the uh, uh, pain protection film business, which has nothing to do at all with, obviously, commercial finance right. uh, that I've been doing and commercial asset management. But the same principles apply, and that's why it will be absolutely ridiculously successful. Uh, and that is because when you look at, and again, I've discovered this over, you know, two decades of doing this, it doesn't matter what business it is. Again, I, sometimes I'm coaching uh, a bar 
Other times I'm coaching a restaurant. Other times I'm coaching somebody that's, uh, you know, that is higher level financial services, uh, all the way to businesses who who do major manufacturing and and everything else. And the dynamic is the same because a lot of the, a lot of the business processes are the same and the mistakes that get made are the same, right? Whether you walk into a yogurt shop or whether you go into a, you know, an automotive dealership, there are certain business principles that are going to, that are going to transition uh, from one to the other. And, and so once you know how to do that, once you know the control mechanisms in business, you can walk into a yogurt shop and make it successful. You can walk into a, a dealership and make it successful. I can walk into a bar. I know nothing about the bar business, but I know the business of the bar business. Therefore, I can make it successful. And it's the same, same principles uh, that, that apply. One of the things you said, obviously, was going after some of the dealership stuff. Um, and I know because you have that background in insurance, uh, that's one of the things you're real comfortable with because you've done a lot of dealership stuff with the insurance and being a farmer's agent and all that stuff. So what what insider information would you say that the, being an insurance agent gave you as far as being able to approach dealerships? Um, probably the insider information would be that, you know, obviously I had somewhat of a relationship with them because they'll also reach out to me for their insurance. Um so there was somewhat of an affiliation, uh, not that the businesses are one and the same, but uh, they're both automotive related in some respect because we insure cars, of course. Right. Um, so I had a little bit of an inside niche there. Um, I'd have to say that was a little bit of help. But again, you have to put yourself out there. Right. You know, um, I don't care whether it's we go to a, a dealership or we go to an auto body shop or wherever we go to try to pick up this business, um, even if it's just a car show we have to put ourselves out there. Right. Um, Cause if you don't ask, you don't know if somebody's going to be interested or not. Right. So right. Um, worst case scenario, somebody's going to say they're, they're not interested or they don't have the need, but you don't know unless you ask, obviously. Right. So right. Uh, definitely putting yourself out there is, is a huge factor when you're new in business. Right. So yeah. Activity, obviously, if you're new yeah. in business and you don't have any customers, well, guess what? You have a lot of time to do sell, sell, right. sell, market and sell. So, uh, and, and that, Again, just get yourself out there, get moving with it. And if you know that what you're doing is special, right? Like I have no doubt. I mean, I would never be involved in anything that isn't special, honestly, uh, and neither should you. Uh, but we take Buster, for instance. I'm going to pick on Buster a little bit pick here. Pick on me. Um, he, great mechanic, you know, can do a lot of stuff there. Obviously, he's really great at, at, the, uh, at, at applying the paint protection uh, film, but he's never actually done any active sales. So I've been actually throwing him in the fire, uh, the last uh, couple of weeks, making him actually get involved in actually the sales process. If you don't have all of the skill sets that are going to go into the business operation, you're really going to hold yourself back. And for those of you that have read my book, maximize your now, one of the things I talk about in there in a whole chapter, which is when you work somewhere or you're involved in a company, you better take it upon yourself to learn every uh, valuable skill set in that company. Because if you don't, you're missing opportunities. If you don't have, let's just say you work for uh, McDonald's, you know, you're, you might be doing the drive through window. Now, you should do everything you can to be the greatest at the drive through window. But you also need to be paying, ten, paying attention to everything else, especially when you're talking about things that are above your pay grade, right, uh, that, are, that are vertical movement. So if I'm working the, the McDonald's drive through I'm paying attention to what the assistant manager is doing. I'm paying attention to what the shift manager is doing and how they're doing it. And I'm learning how does the manager move? What is, what is the manager's responsibilities? How do they do it? Because if I'm working that drive through What's in my mind is I want to be manager some, someday, right? That's got to be what's in your mind. If it isn't, it needs to be. Uh, you can't just be satisfied with wherever you're at. If you are, you're, 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 you're lost. You're, you're done. So expand your skill set, especially when you can do it for free, right? And I was on you the other night about the ability to be able to expand your skill set riskless. And what I mean by that or what I meant by that is if you're in an opportunity in your job or in your business where you can expand your skill set, you can go grab another skill set and you don't got to pay the price for it, meaning that you can do it for free and you can do it like while you're already at work. And, you know, there's, there's literally no price to pay. There's no money to pay and there's no time to pay. You're already there. Uh, it's looking you right in the face. You can just go grab that skill set for free. You're a fool if you don't do it. You have to grab those skill sets, especially when it's the top level skill set. 
Uh, and as anybody that's, you know, followed me at all knows, the very top level skill set is what, Buster? Sales. Sell, sell, sales. sales. Look, you can do, you can be great at whatever. I mean, you can be the greatest, uh, you know, artist that ever walked the face of the earth. But if you can't sell it, it doesn't mean anything. No. You're going to be sitting at your, you know, your little apartment, you know, on the bad side of town, you know, with a cup of noodles, looking at your masterpieces that nobody ever bought. Right. I mean, you do want to be Hunter Biden, don't you? <laughs> um, so, you know, there, there's a guy that, you know, can't paint, but damn, he can sell, can he? Yeah. So sales, sells, sells, sells. So especially the sales uh, uh, skill set. Anybody that's, that doesn't do sales or normally doesn't do sales, if you're sitting in a position at your company, your job, and you can expand your, your skill set into sales, grab it. Grab it. Because where that can lead is just, you know, unbelievable pace, places. And again, it is the highest paid profession in the world, okay, uh, sales. That's it. Not doctors, not lawyers, not astrophysicists or, you know, sons of presidents that paint, okay? Sales. Sales are, is, is the, the highest level skill set. So you want to grab it, especially when it's free, oh, right? Definitely. And I know you started, we started having you reach out to people. Yeah. Um, tell, tell everybody about how that went. So I, I told them, I said, look, here's what you want to do. I want you to start reaching out to some people with sand rails mm -hmm. and people that have nice sand rails that you know your service would help, that you know that they would be a ben it would be a benefit to them. For you to, to, to do paint protection on their sand rail would be a huge benefit. Because you know what it can do. You yeah. know, my brand new sand rail looked like crap after four trips. Yeah. It's brand new. And it looked like crap after four trips. It was starting to get sandblasted. So we, I, I'm ridiculously convinced what it can do. And I know you are too because you've been yeah. doing it a lot longer. So I threw you out there and said, start reaching out to them. Tell us about what, how that went. Well, initially it, it went a little rough because I'm not very good at making myself vulnerable you were in, uncomfortable weren't i'm you? very uncomfortable i give i got very even over the phone that is a that is a huge thing that um or a huge task that was very hard for me which normally the physical side of things or or applying is is not um it's not typically hard for me so going into just talking to people it was so hard for me and now you know that that mentality that you have you know um, been pushing on me of not becoming complacent, not becoming content, and just continuing to grow. Right. I mean, it's it's been a huge game changer it, just in the past couple of weeks that I've been doing it. But reaching out to um, people with sand cars, um, uh, it went great. I, I got I've I've got a few people that are seriously interested in it, and people that I've never met ever. Right. And, I, and I've been in the sand car industry uh, for quite a bit, and People that I have never met, um, they are very, very seriously uh, inquiring about it and getting it done. So, so, so your prospecting skill yes. set is coming along. Your it's, closing it's, skill set is what we still got to work yeah, on. Yeah, the closing is, is what's really uh, got kicking my butt. In. Right, because yeah. it, 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 it has to remember, it has to go from interested to they're doing it, right? Yes. So there's that transition because it's... I'm, gonna say, I'm not going to say it's easy to get people interested. It isn't because you got to, like Donnie said, put yourself out mm -hmm. there and you can't be afraid to take your solution to the world. Again, if you know that you do something that will benefit people, right? Because this is, when I work with businesses, this is always the hesitation. Mm -hmm. People are always so, I don't, I don't say, I don't, fear is not the right word, but they're hesitant. They're hesitant to take what they do uh to, to new people, even if it's people they know, right? I mean, sometimes even even if you know the pe the person, you're like, well, I don't want to approach them with it. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna say, sound salesy, and you know, it's gonna be awkward. But but think about that for a second. If you know that what you do would benefit that person, aren't you really screwing them over by not talking to them about it? 100%. Yes, you are. So if you know that you could benefit a friend or a family member or, you know, a, a community or, you know, people that you're going to come in contact with or people you're going to reach out with, if you know that your solution will actually benefit them, shame on you for not doing so because they're going to be better off, mm -hmm. right? So, so your prospecting is going well. Mm -hmm. You've re you started reaching out and I don't think you've even reached out to all that many, what, 25, 30, how many would you say? Not even that, honestly. I've, uh, for the sand car, sand rail stuff, I've probably reached out to, Maybe 
15 people. Okay, so 15 people. He's, he prospected 15 people that he knows this service could benefit. And how many are interested out of the 15? Four. Four. That's 25%. So on his prospecting, he's got 25%. Uh, which is amazing, which again, but if you have a valuable service or product and you genuinely know that and you take it to people that you know it would benefit and you take it to them with enthusiasm, yeah. again, with that message that you know it could benefit them, you're going to get those kind of responses. And again, those people are, are, are very happy that you are bringing that to them oh, yeah. because like me, they probably had no idea that solution was even available yeah. or that they could get more for what they, what they thought. Right. We walk, we walk around. And again, this, this happens to everybody, consumers, especially most consumers don't like to ask questions. So when consumers even go to look at a, something like a product or a service or something like that, they don't like to ask a lot of questions. It's just like, well, here's my base needs. Can you fill that? And then the salesperson's like, yeah, I can fill your base needs. But it really doesn't go like for deep dives, no. right? Where you're actually saying, okay, here's what's really going on. And again, as salespeople, you cannot rely on your customer to tell you everything. You've got to probe them, right? But that's a good thing, not a bad thing. You've got to probe your customer's needs. And sometimes your customer won't even know what their needs completely are because they haven't thought through about all of the uh, potential uh, uh, scenarios. For instance, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a perfect example, and this, this goes right into you know, to, to what Donnie does and what he does for me uh, again um, we've ex we've expanded the insurance offerings, right? When we started doing bit, yeah. business, and one of the things that I was missing for a, a long time was the umbrella right. policy, yep. right? Uh, so you finally started talking about th this umbrella policy and like how valuable it would be to me. Now that was something that hadn't even occurred to me, right? So why you know take this time to you know push insurance a little bit? Why is umbrella? Why are umbrella policies important for people? Well, then the, the main reason why I brought it to your attention is uh, uh, part of being an insurance agent is I build a relationship with people. Obviously, I'm good friends with Corey, um, but I could see his life changing and gaining some assets. And in turn, you are gaining risk at the same time. Right. And uh, with just a standard un underlying policy, you can only protect so much with that policy. Right. So as your assets grow... Um, especially if you're in business and your business is expanding, then you need to start protecting yourself. Right. And to get the next layer of protection and in insurance is the umbrella policy. Um, so, of course, uh, you buy it in increments of millions of dollars, uh, one million through ten, and uh, it's it it overlaps or goes beyond where your underlying policy would fall short. Uh, so, if you're being sued. Um, your assets are what's at risk. And I could see Corey's assets growing because he's expanding his business exponentially. Right. And uh, I, I could see that he had a risk. And again, going back to what you said, I know that I can provide that protection. And if I don't bring it to your attention, I mean, I can't be afraid to sell it to you. I can't, you know, think right. that I'm just selling you something. Right. But if I don't bring it to your attention and tomorrow something happens and you're sued and you could have been covered for a couple hundred dollars, well, it was a no-brainer. You'd have taken it, most likely. Well, yeah, so I, ha no I, have to, <laughs> I have to at least put myself out there and put that question out there to just say, hey, have you thought about this? Right. Um, you know, looking at it from an outsider's perspective is uh, paying attention to stuff like that when it comes to insurance. So, right, right. Um, umbrellas are very important from that standpoint, but then they also give the protection for frivolous lawsuits, too. So if somebody knocks on your door and sues you for whatever reason— they don't like your Hunter Biden joke on this show, whatever it might be, um, and they want to sue you, well, you just get to file a claim on the umbrella. No big deal. Right. And it gets turned over to the attorneys right. Uh, right. That, are, that are retained on the insurance company. Well, it sure sounds so. to me like everybody should have an umbrella policy. Yeah. Uh, Anybody who's in business, yeah. for sure. Absolutely. Anybody. Yeah. Sure. yeah. And we're going to have him back to do his own show for, for, for insurance, by the way. Right. Uh, because he's expanding his, his insurance business. Uh, and he's going to be doing some uh, higher end products uh, for his customers as well as uh, the general public. So we'll have him back for that. So that sells again, knowing that you have a customer that has a need. If you don't bring it to me, if you're like, well, I don't want to talk, you know, maybe it's going to be salesy if we're hanging out and I start bringing it up again, he's screwing me over. Something happens and I find out that he knew about this umbrella policy the whole time. And I end up getting, you know, sued because I, you know, 
do something stupid with my sand rail or something. And then, you know, the, the insurance that I have on the sand rail doesn't cover the damage. And then all of a sudden now my assets and my business and everything else is exposed. And he knew about this umbrella policy that would help back that up the whole time. I'm going to be pretty pissed off, aren't I? So I'd probably lose a customer out of the deal. Yeah, ex- exactly. That's exactly what happened. Right? Yeah. So again, you have to be aware when you're, you know, uh, working with customers, you have to probe them for how, they're moving and what their life is doing financially and, 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 you know, the problems they're trying to solve. Uh, one of the businesses I was coaching, uh, recently, uh, was a, a nutrition store, uh, and they were getting customers in, but the problem was that their, their average ticket was pretty low. And one of the fixes that I put in for this, this nutrition store was to tell them, look, if you want to increase your sales and get, you know, increase your, 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 uh, your, uh, uh, your revenue, and then obviously get your profit up, you have got to get your ticket sales up. So yes, we can increase the traffic. Of course we can. But if you leave your ticket sales the same, well, you're going to be losing half the money that you, the potential, right? Half the potential because you're not increasing the tickets. Hmm. And really the, it, it, it was so rudimentary, the fix, the fix was this. There, there are people that are working at the nutrition stores don't ask any questions of anybody. They're not asking questions of, of the customers coming in. Basic stuff like, well, what are your what what are your goals? What do you what do you hear to you know? Why are you buying this shake? Why are you buying these you know these these uh, uh, weight loss pills? Why are you buying the you know the the supplement that that's uh, a weight gainer, mm-hmm. right? And they would just they would sell them the weight gainer or the or the or the uh, the the, the uh, uh, pre workout or the the shake, but they would never take it farther than that. They would never ask them what their goals were. Now, who's getting screwed by this? The customer. The customer is getting screwed the most, and then the business is getting screwed second because there's a lot more uh, opportunity there for everybody to solve more uh, problems, get a better outcome. So what I did with them is I said, look, start having your people at least say, this is a pretty cool product. What made you want to buy it? And what, what, are, you, what are your goals? What do, you, what, what do you want your outcome to be? And the second people start saying, well, I want to lose weight or I want to gain weight or I, w- I want to just feel better. I want to sleep better, right? Whatever the reasons you would go into a health food store are, um, there's a lot more products that are going to help with that. Yeah. And again, the consumer, just like I didn't know about the umbrella policy, you can't expect that your customer knows all the different products you have or all the different types of solutions you have for the outcome they're, they're looking for. So once I taught them that small move, right, or that basic move, their ticket sell went up from like $10 per average ticket to 15 like literally a 50% increase in average sales just because they asked a couple of basic questions. There was a lot more I could have done with them as far as like actually really exploded those sales. They had a lot more happy customers too. A lot more happy customers because the outcomes are greater. So as the customers then are out, you know, with these solutions, they're getting better outcomes, which then then make them feel better about the business, right? So then, then they come back to the business. And when they do, they are asking more questions. They become a better customer. They become a better buyer. And that's really the lesson to be learned there is never hesitate to bring your solutions to your, to your market and never hesitate to probe them because you could be sitting on a solution that would really, really help them and really be a huge game changer for the outcome that they're looking for. And it's not on the customer. Business owners, listen to me right here. This is a teaching moment. It is not on the customer to know what solutions you can provide. It is on you to probe the customer for the outcome they're looking for so that you then can match them with the solutions that you would happen to have. That is on you 100%. And if you aren't doing that, if people are coming to you and doing business with you and you are not sitting and spending at least five, 10 minutes and probing them for what outcomes are important to them, and then providing the solutions, then shame on you because you're screwing the customer and you're losing sales. It is the dumbest thing in business that I ever see. Always ask. If I'm running a bar and someone comes in and orders a drink, I say, absolutely, happy to get you a drink. Why are you buying the drink? Well, this and that. Okay, well, you know what else goes good with a drink? Some food. Would you know? Would you like to? I'd be. You'd be shocked how many bars you could walk into that serve food. The bartender would even ask if you wanted some food. Prime opportunity to help get a better outcome, and it's missed. It's missed ninety nine percent of the time. A lot of the fixes that I do with businesses is I go in there and I basically tell them, well, you know, you could do this one more thing, and it would change everything. Oh crap! They were looking at the whole time. 
Um, sometimes it's that obvious and sometimes it's not. But as business owners, obviously we have our blinders on and we're just solving, you know, each emergency as it comes up. We're not obviously thinking. So, but yeah, but, but that's perfect insight for this. Uh, and as far as the business, you know, this business goes, um, I know the future goal for me with, with CCD is to take it as far as it possibly be taken. I mean, that's just the way my mind always works. I always want to take everything as far as it could possibly go. Uh, and sometimes that's a great thing. Sometimes that, you know, uh, gets me in the weeds a little bit, but that's fine because if you're not pushing, if you're not growing, then you are shrinking. If you're not moving forward in business and you're not doing more and better and you just think you're going to stay where you're at and you're just going to ride it out, let me tell you something about trying to ride it out. You are going to go back down that hill, lickety split, and you're going to end up out of business, right? I mean, inflation, right? Getting back to, to Hunter's dad, inflation, right? You guys better start making a hell of a lot more money just to keep up with the inflation, I mean, the inflation, the clip we have going, I mean, you're going to have to start making 30, 40% more money, you know, next year than you made this year just to cover the damn inflation. Are you making the moves to do that? If not, you better get on it. So uh, what, what do you envision uh, the future of CCD to be? What, what do you want to get out of it, Donnie? Uh, obviously, as much as we can. I mean, uh, getting ourselves outside that comfort zone uh, knows we're expanding, uh, being a little uncomfortable in business, making those moves, uh, I think tells you you're doing the right thing, right. actually. Um, but, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind uh, making it to the point where we could possibly franchise it. I mean, why not? Why why not go why down not? that path? I mean, Absolutely. If, if your goal isn't going to be that high, then maybe you shouldn't be in business, honestly. That, I mean, that's right. The, the end goal should be something that's just as far out there as possible. Um, there shouldn't be a finish line for being in business ever. Yeah. There shouldn't be a finish ever. line. So, never, ever. Um, you know, as far as we can take it, uh, whether it's, we expand in more employees or we move it to, you know, DIY kits online, or, I mean, we're already looking at expanding into windshield protection and doing uh, ceramic coating on top of this stuff now. So right. I mean, we're already looking at additional things we haven't even put really on the platter yet. So, right. well, yeah, because there's, there's more, and better outcomes we could supply our customers we can solve correct yeah. so again it's on us to go look for the additional solutions that we could then get uh, have our customers have a better outcome right and the more we're looking at the outcomes being why we're doing what we're doing to get our customer a better outcome that's when again you're moving correctly remember like he said you've got to get uncomfortable okay but the reason why you have to get uncomfortable isn't because you're just you know setting Indian complacent. style, you right? Be complacent at that point. You got to move. You you got to keep offering better and better for your customers. You got to keep doing better for your marketplace. You got to keep bringing better solutions, right? You can't just keep bringing the same solution uh, because you're screwing the customer. You're never going to hear me stop saying that because, uh, as, as some of you know already, I didn't start making really ridiculous money until I started just thinking about helping people. That's when it clicked. When I just thought about making money. And it's not that I was like doing people wrong or, you know, not moving, you know, ethically or morally in the marketplace. I was, but I just, my mindset was about making money, making money, making money, making money, but be ethical, be moral. But when I switched and said, let me just start helping people as much as I possibly can get the greatest outcome that I could possibly give them, the money just starts coming. I mean, the money's not even a problem. I don't, I don't even think about it anymore. It might just happens when you do that. So new business owners uh, and some current business owners that you guys are stuck, okay? You have got to switch your mindset and you got to start thinking about bringing greater outcomes to your marketplace, bringing greater outcomes to your customers, probing them, understanding them, learning their needs more. And again, getting out of your comfort zone, like Donnie said, you know, and everybody's got comfort zones. I have comfort zones. We all have comfort zones. But you better get ready to break them because if you don't, you stop growing. And if you stop growing, why did you even bother getting in business, right? Uh, and you're right. I, I agree. Every business owner should, when they start their business, right? And we all started, you know, our first businesses at the, you know, kitchen table, uh, you know, all scared. Like, how do you do an LLC? What's the website? Uh, how do I get a bank account, right? <laughs> Uh, Buster, you went through Me. that recently. <laughs> yep. um, and you go from that to, you know, 
running a multi-million dollar, you know, operation to, you know, starting other businesses and then obviously to, you know, it, it, dreaming big about those businesses, right? So it goes from the kitchen table, how do I start an LLC and how do I get a bank account for it uh, to, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to be uh, nationwide and franchising. And if your mind's not thinking like that, well, then you're going to hold yourself back. You don't be afraid to dream big. And a lot of people are afraid to dream big. I always call it the fear of success, when I'm coaching, I'm coaching people, I always say, look, so, you know, it looks to me like you got a fear of success. Mm -hmm. And I always love when I say that with the look on people's face, because they go like, what the hell are you talking about? I don't have a fear of success. Yes, you do. Because the fear is you don't want to think too big. You don't want to make your goals too big because you're afraid you won't be able to hit them. And that becomes the fear of success. If I think too big, if my goals are too lofty, and I can't hit them, oh, crap, everyone's going to judge me, uh, I, I'll be a failure, and that's nonsense. It's not the way to think about it. Uh, and if you think about it like that, again, you're going to hold yourself back from doing really, really great things. Um, so, sky's the limit. What do you want to do with it, Buster? I, I um, like I said earlier, I'm very passionate about it, and it's the gratification of helping everyday people. Uh, I love helping people. I really do. Um, I want to grow the business as far as we can. Like Donnie said, I mean, I, I would love to take it all the way to the franchise level where we can have different locations all over the United States. And, you know, um, not only that, but informing our customers and not even our customers, just everybody informing people about what we do, why we do it, you know, and how we do it. I'm not afraid to show my my techniques my you know my skill whatever i'm not i'm not afraid of that and right. i want i want people to see what's really going on um with the business and just like you said uh you know you have this this uh skill set or you know this product that can help people if you're not letting people know about it you're you're screwing them over and that that's that has you know taken me within the last couple of weeks of you coaching me on this. Right. Um, it's taken up until now to really realize that. And uh, it's opened my eyes so much. And, you know, the uncomfortable thing too, that's, that's just hit recently. Right. Um, but as for CCD, I would love to take it as far and high as possible. And I would love to see multiple locations. I would love to see, you know, the franchise portion of it. And like I said, really informing. Well, um, I think, I think what, what, what I want for you, and I think maybe, you know, hopefully you want this for yourself too. Like when it comes to the industry, everybody's going to be saying that, Oh, that's, that's Buster Davis over there. Right. <laughs> so, you know, five years from now, when we have, uh, you know, the, the CCD, uh, the CCD, uh, uh, Lambo at mm -hmm. SEMA, right. And you're demonst you're demonstrating, uh, you know, how to do this, right. For the yeah. franchise opportunities that we'll be offering. Yeah. Uh, everyone's going to go, that's Buster Davis. He's the greatest. He's the greatest. PBF Did you see his cuts? <laughs> that guy's got samurai like cuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I and getting, and, and, and training people, you know, cause I think you'd be a good trainer. I think, you know, having people come in and, and I mean, obviously we're going to start, you know, hiring under you here real, real soon where you're going to start training people. But I think being a master trainer, uh, too, especially when, again, when you, when you talk about franchising and you talk about actually, you know, moving your business to a franchise level, well, you have to train those people on all, all aspects of it. If you want to create little mini U's out there, well, then you got to be able to then take all of, the, all of your processes that you perfected, right, or should have gotten pretty close to perfection, and then you just got to go and duplicate those processes at the franchise. Yeah. That's why, you know, places like McDonald's uh, are so successful because, they can duplicate that literally down to uh, what the bathroom smells like, right? And we all know what a McDonald's bathroom smells like, right? Uh, I was working at McDonald's, so we have a good friend of ours that owns several McDonald's, and so that's always the, you know. But we get, what, well, we get one F-bomb on YouTube, right? Right, Amelia? I've, I've about McFucking had it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got, uh, I dropped that joke on my buddy, by the way, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I heard that like 15 years ago. I was new to me though. I thought it was hilarious. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you have to be able to duplicate exactly everything that made the other location successful. You have to then, 
you have to do it. And when you get it down like a McDonald's does or an in and out uh, who's my favorite right now for, for reasons, let's go Brandon. Um, they can just pop up a new one and it's instantly successful, right? I mean, there's no question about it. You ever seen a McDonald's go out of business? No. You ever seen an In-N-Out go out of business? No, doesn't happen. Because when you can duplicate that success, it works again in the new location because of the processes. And it really is about the processes. And the skill set of what's happening is, is also one of those processes. Yeah. Um, and so I'm going to be looking to you uh, in this business to really perfect the process of installing PPF. And he, you know, he's already factory certified and everything else. We've been really working on his, on his, uh, on his skill and his education um, as far as the skill of doing it goes. Because, again, if he's going to become the greatest in the world, the greatest anyone's ever seen at doing this, which is what he should strive for, well, he can't stop working on that skill set. Uh, and he has to keep every day working on that skill set as well as grabbing the other skill sets as well as grabbing the marketing and the sales and again the back some of the back office stuff and inventory control and all that stuff so uh learn all aspects of the business so uh uh, because you can again get a lot of that for free so yeah you guys are amazing teachers and my days are definitely filled Mm -hmm. with uh, a lot of knowledge and i'm just trying to Grab all of it and little and little laughing, little little crying, yeah, little, oh little, yeah, little screaming, oh, right? Oh it, man! It, if you're not laughing, crying, and screaming all in one day at your business, you ain't doing it right. That's a fact. Absolutely, not. <laughs> that is a <laughs> fact. That's a fact. You got to get uncomfortable, man. You got to be oh. okay with being uncomfortable, big time. Um, and I push myself to be uncomfortable because I just know that's how it works. You, I've got to make myself uncomfortable. So I've got, I've got to put myself in situations with, uh. uh clients with with uh uh my partners and employees with whomever i put myself in uncomfortable uh, situations on purpose just so i can continue to grow that skill set right and i have to do it you know personally i have to get uncomfortable with a lot of my clients because you know it's my job if they're screwing stuff up i got to get in there and fix it so it isn't always comfortable but it's always the right thing and as long as I know that I'm doing it, as long as I'm getting uncomfortable, making other people uncomfortable for their, for, for what is the betterment of their outcome. Right. It's good. Right. Tough love. Right. Like a, like a good coach, you know, sometimes, I mean, good. I have yet to ever seen a championship level coach that didn't scream once in a while, because that's what it takes. That's what it takes. Coach has got to get uncomfortable. Players got to get uncomfortable. The other coaches got to get uncomfortable because that's what it takes to win. Right. So get uncomfortable. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, anything else you guys want to mention? Talk about? Well, Donnie brought up the windshield protection. That's, yeah. that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's something we're, we're working on. We're still, you know, just fine tuned. That's a brand new product and uh, we'll bring that to market when it's ready. We know it's going to be super, super solid. Um, and we'll Got launch that. Piloted on the sand cars. So yep. that'll be out there at the dunes when we do a debut out there yeah that's so true that's true we'll uh we'll get to do some research and development see how it works r&d yeah yep. we're heading out to the dunes for some uh sand rail r&d yep. uh as well as some marketing and a good time too you can you can do it all right you can do some r&d some marketing and have a good time right. all at the same always make your business fun and again don't make it boring if it's boring find some way to to to, to spice it up man so find some way to make it fun make it challenging because uh, that'll keep you involved in it um, a lot of people that I come across that are struggling, it's because they just they fell in, fell into this routine of just monotony. They're not doing anything different, or they're not doing anything that's a challenge. So they it gets monotonous. And I don't, I don't care what you do for a living, it all can get monotonous. So you have to then find ways to make it a challenge. Uh, you know, tie one har- tie, tie one arm behind your back for the day, and you know, just make it extra challenging, right? It'll at least get you back Sometime. involved in it. It'll get you, you know, get you uh, excited about actually doing the work again. So, yeah, yeah that's right. Well, we'll have, they'll have a follow up show, right? So this is month two uh, of CCD. Um, so we'll do an update show. Let's say maybe we'll, we'll do the. Let's tell you what, Amelia. Let's make this the last show of the season. Uh, of this season, we'll we'll do a follow up with CCD. And we'll just see what the progress is like uh, no between now and then. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. pressure. <laughs> Lots of pressure, but I love pressure. Get uncomfortable. All right, guys. Hey, thanks for joining us for this uh, this week's show. Again, please like, subscribe, share it wherever you can. Uh, it really means a lot, and hopefully you've got a lot of value out of this. And we will see you next week.